This is Mary. Welcome to the Daily Reflection Podcast. I've got quite a long time here doing this, and I haven't arrived anywhere, so I really consider myself a seasoned beginner. So constantly, every day I get up, there's something brand new that's going on. Today, wisdom has two ingredients. One is intellect, and the other is love. And without the love, I don't think people really understand what's going on in this journey and recovery. Welcome to the Daily Reflection Podcast. My name is Michael Lynn from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I'm Lee McGinnis from Leesburg, Virginia. As members of the recovery community, we created this podcast as a way to provide experience, strength, and hope through the lens of the Daily Reflection book. Each day, we interview members of the recovery community in the hope that their experience may provide inspiration. We value inclusion and diversity, and we really want to provide a platform for all the voices of recovery. We aren't affiliated with any 12-step or recovery program, but you may hear these mentioned throughout the course of an interview. Hey, before we get to the show, I'd like to ask a favor. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, it'd be great if you could leave us a comment or a rating. This is going to do a couple of things. It's going to help us expand our reach and improve the show. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks so much to Jeff Bain. Frederick Marilyn for editing services. Appreciate your help. What's on the agenda for today? Well, I'm very excited about this. First of all, it's April 27th, and uh, we have with us today in the studio, Mary from Florida, and she's here to share with us on today's daily reflection, which is joyful discoveries. Fantastic. Mary, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on the podcast. Thanks. Nice to be here. So Mary, we get started in the same way every day. We ask the guest to read the daily reflection for the day. Would you help us get started and read? Sure. Joyful Discoveries, April 27th. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously, you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others this is the great fact for us. alcoholics anonymous page 164 sobriety is a journey of joyful discoveries each day brings new experience awareness greater hope deeper faith broader tolerance i must maintain these attributes or i will have nothing to pass on great events for this recovering alcoholic are the normal everyday joys found in being able to live another day in God's grace. That is a beautiful reading. Thank you so much for reading it for us. Um, Mary, what resonates with you right off the bat as you read this? There's a lot in here. Just curious what comes up first for you. Well, um, my recovery began in California 47 years ago. And at the end of every meeting, this was read. Page 164 was read. And as time went on and as the years have gone on, I found it to be more of a prayer. Talking about prayer, uh, what role does prayer play in your program of recovery? I think it's um, <clears throat> a major part of my recovery. Uh, it took me quite a long time to understand that this program was a spiritual program. As time has gone on and as, as I've worked uh, and participated in, in this program, I found that uh, the whole thing is about developing a relationship with um, a power greater than yourself and um, to improve that conscious contact. So prayer is a daily part of my program. I'm curious as you're talking, I mean, I know a little bit about your story because we've talked <laughs> before, so I might be leading a little bit here, but. You know, it says in the reading on page 164, God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. And I'm wondering how that has unfolded for you. What was it that made you realize there was more to this? You know, in the beginning, I would just hear the words. uh, And then as time went on, um, and I think as you gain recovery and you start to experience um, the journey of sobriety, you start to realize that there's new things being revealed all the time. My sponsor, I, I, I was sponsored by um, great people and the husband and wife team, but uh, she would say something to me that I didn't understand for years. She'd say the road gets narrower and the horizon gets broader. 
And I just thought, what does that mean? As time went on, I realized that um, the very first thing, you know, it, it's not on this reading, but it, it, but it basically says our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. And I do. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that I didn't know. Let's put it that way. And I started to think about this. And I realized when I was about five years in recovery, I realized that the road had gotten narrower and the horizon had gotten broader. And it wasn't a bad thing. I used to think that was going to be a bad thing. The road gets narrower and the horizon gets broader. But the reality was, is what I was doing at a year, I thank God I wasn't doing it five years. And what I was doing at 10 isn't what I was doing at five. And I started to see that I would, I had more revealed to me that that was not how I wanted to live my life. I don't, I've got quite a long time here doing this and I haven't arrived anywhere. So I really consider myself a seasoned beginner. So constantly, I mean, constantly, just even daily. And it's fascinating to me. Every day I get up, there's something brand new that's going on today. Today was, it was an interesting day. I woke up and realized somebody had gotten into my vehicle that was, I left it unlocked and that's what people do. And uh, uh, so that was kind of an interesting way to start the day. And basically they took $2 that I have there anyways for the homeless. So I forget that. I was really blessed. I, you know, if you have to, police officers kept trying to get me to press charges. I said, well, for $2, no, that's fine. Let them have it. And it was so funny because a little bit later, I lived near a, a body of water and I was looking out the window and there was something floating in the water. And I said, what is that? And I finally realized it was a brand new chair. And where I live in Florida, we had a big windstorm this week. So I've got a brand new chair that I salvaged out of the water today. So it was kind of like somebody, one of my sponsors said to me, oh, you lost something, gained it. And I said, I did. I did. And I left it out in case anybody goes by and said, that's my chair. I'll be happy to give it back to them. But yeah, I'm constantly given more information each day. I didn't know that I would want to develop a relationship with this presence. It was it was not in my agenda when I first came in. So I'm, I'm just going to read on a little bit. So I'll break down what what I how I like this um, page 164. So I'm supposed to ask every morning in meditation what I can do for the person who is still sick, which is part of my just part of who I am. Um, I didn't understand either that selfishness and self-centeredness was the root of our problem. As the years have gone on, I finally understood that this program really isn't about me. It's about trying to connect with a relationship to do thy will, not my will. And um, it became clear in like the third step prayer where it says, take away our difficulties so we can better do thy will. I used to read it the way it said, but the truth is I wanted to do it my way. You know, take away my difficulties so I can get back to doing Mary's way. And, And then the same with the seventh step prayer. In the very end, it says, you know, grant me strength to go out from here to do your bidding, not my bidding. And as the years have gone on, I've realized this program really isn't about me. It's, it's, um, it is about me, but it's how I can be used as some type of an instrument to, um, for, for others. And it's okay with me today, I, which I, I'm amazed at. I'm just amazed at. When I, first came, when I first came in and I didn't realize... Once you get to the 10th step, you've entered the world of the spirit. So what does that mean? But it's a different feeling. I'm not alone. And I might, I might be alone, but I'm not lonely by any means. And I feel pretty much safe and protected because of the 10th step promise that talks about being placed in a position of neutrality, which says, and they define it, safe and protected. And that is something that I have definitely experienced. So when it says the answers will come if my house is in order, I think that's really important. Uh, You know, when it says to do a fearless moral inventory, it doesn't say to do a fearful garbage inventory. It says, what are my morals and values? You know, and where am I going against them? And as the way I do the steps, I can come out of my four steps seeing the values and the principles that I've been going against due to fear basically, and not faith. So as the years have gone on, I've, I've started to get my houses a little bit more in order. And I have apparently gotten to a place where I am of use to other people. 
There's nothing better than watching the light go on in someone's eyes. Nothing better. Because we're all like, what do they used to say that? You used to say a dead man walking or something. Your eyes look as though we're dead. And then to watch that light come in as Bill watched Abby's light come in as his eyes is, is a gift that I don't think too many people really see. Uh, uh, I believe the 12-step programs are the most spiritual things going on right now. So it says, the answers will come if my house is in order, but obviously I cannot transmit something I haven't got. <clears throat> There's a personal thing I will share with you on that in a minute. So I have to see to it that my relationship with this presence, with this God of my experience, because it's one that I've experienced, is right. And great events, definitely great events will come to pass for me and countless others. And this is a great fact for me. And I like this last part because I believe the next paragraph is the drill that we do. This is our drill. So it's a journey. Joy Beth told me right from the very beginning, she said to me, you can look at this recovery as an obstacle course or an adventure. That's going to be my choice. And it still is my choice. Either it's going to, it's going to be an adventure or an obstacle course. And, and I like to kind of look at it as an adventure. So each day brings new experience, awareness. I just told you an experience, salvaging a chair out in the water. Very exciting. Didn't know how I was going to get out. But then a neighbor came along. I said, get over here. Help me do this. And then so a boat came by and said, what What you got? And I said, I got a chair. It was floating around out here. I'm getting it. You know. So it, it was just, it was really kind of fun. So it was a new experience. It was an awareness, greater hope, deeper faith, broader tolerance. I must maintain these attributes. Now, notice it doesn't say for me to get more intellect, does it? I don't know how many people say to me, oh, you take me through the book. How many times have you been through the book? What do you want to go through it for? I, they, I don't know if they think they're going to gain some more knowledge, you know, but knowledge isn't the answer here. It's going to be experience on how we've actually applied it in our life. That's, that's my drill. It deals with um, feelings and experiences in order to pass it on. I think it's so great that we were a program of attraction, not promotion. I think uh, the Zoom has helped so many of us recovering because people are becoming more attracted, you know, than just their normal group. They can go anywhere and they can see. Like this weekend, I was on a Zoom all weekend at some conference I was on. And I have three, two or three people already calling me because they're attracted to an energy that is alive program is alive. My program is alive today. At 20 years of recovery, I had an intellectual program. For the last 27, I've had one that touches my heart. And uh, yes, I have a lot of knowledge and stuff, but you know, that, that really doesn't cut it. In fact, I read something out of Emmett Fox that I've never forgotten. It said, wisdom has two ingredients. One is intellect and the other is love. And without the love, I don't think people can really understand what's going on in this uh, journey and recovery. I want to go back to that thing where it says you can't give something away that you haven't got. So uh, I'm a I'm a person that came into recovery and I was a single parent and with a child. And um, my child was 10. Uh, I, I did a lot of damage uh, as um, an alcoholic woman that was a mother. And, and that's probably the worst. You know, men that can throw their hat wherever they want, but I don't think mothers can. And, uh, and um, you know, they say you won't regret the past. I regret that. I regret a lot of how I parented this child. And as the years went on, I, I, uh, I remember my biggest thing at five years of recovery was that I wanted to finally be the best mother. <clears throat> There was, and a big of me, I always say, she was 15 by then. But um, what happened was, is it's been a journey, um, one that has been up and down and back and forth. And uh, and I worked a lot of steps on this. And it took me until I was around 30 years or more in recovery before I really got to the exact nature of my wrong as a parent. And uh, and I went through kind of a metamorphosis. I just, it was it was a big change. Up until then, it was up and down, never knowing what's going to happen one way or the other. It was just, it was a real hard thing to do. And I've talked to other parents about this. And 
But as a result of doing some step work and stuff, I saw that in actuality, my child was never the problem. It was something to do with me and abandonment and stuff. And, and unfortunately, this child was the product of effective human reality here on my part. Um, anyway, so as time went on, um, things got better and better. And I had a I was asked to speak at a conference, and she was attending that conference. And I little, I didn't even know this was going to happen. But uh, the night before I spoke, she came in and she asked me a question, and she said, "I just want to ask you something, Mom." And I said, "What?" And she said, "When did it become okay? When did I? When did you realize you loved me and it became okay?" And I went, "Oh, wow." I said, that's a profound question. I said, sweetheart, I said, the day you were born, I loved you. The day, from the minute I saw you, you were the most beautiful child in the world. And if I'd have known better, I'd have done better. And I couldn't give away something I didn't have. And what I didn't have was I didn't have emotional sobriety. I didn't have emotional security. I I had fear and I had um a lot of anxiety and pain and a disease, but I didn't have love and I didn't know how to show love and until I learned it from people in this program in my recovery. I couldn't give you something I didn't have. Now, I could intellectually say things to you about it, but I couldn't give it to you until I had it inside. So it means an awful lot to me. Uh, I think that's um, been, been kind of the story of my whole recovery is that um, that second step that said I came to believe that there was a power. I knew I came to believe that the power because I saw it in you people and other people. By recovery, I've come to believe in that power because of my experience and what I've been able to receive uh, through grace. I love that. And I, I could listen to you talk <clears throat> for hours. I, I'm, I'm curious about how you got into the program and how you learned how to work the steps. Okay. Um, in 1973, it wasn't necessarily popular to, to join a 12-step program, and I knew nothing about uh, the program at all. My disease had gotten me to the point where I spent, um, uh, I had a lot of blackouts. Um, it was just, I was going to doctors that were giving me this wonderful little pill called Valium, and, and a life was pretty unmanageable, and I was really powerless. and. When I come out of a blackout one time, I realized that I would be yelling at the only thing I loved most in my life was, was this child. And so I decided that I would um, only drink in bars. And so when I get home, I had a babysitter that was in the apartment complex. And uh, I would say, would you watch her while I go for a drink? And and then, of course, you know, that never worked because once you start, you can't stop. And finally, I'd keep calling and they'd say, why don't you just leave her overnight? And I said, OK, and uh, pick her up the next morning. And one morning I went over and knocked on the door and the mother answered and said, Mary, I just haven't really gotten to know you that well. We know your daughter very well. And um, she asked me to come in for a cup of coffee. And in those days, that's called a 12-step call. She was. She told me she was from New England, where I had been raised, and she'd gone to a very good college and was an engineer out in California and in that Lockheed. And, and then she said, uh, and I'm an alcoholic. And I said, you are? And she told me her story. And when she was done, I, this is how ignorant I guess I was um I I said I said my god I know a lot of people who drink and could probably use that program and that's when she invited me to an open meeting and uh and uh, and, and I was blessed from the get-go um I went to that meeting and um the speaker was the first woman alcoholic west of the Mississippi and um uh, she spoke and I don't know. Today I know it was the language of the heart I heard that, you know, and it was a, a, it was amazing. And I got into right away. Here I was in the apartment building, you know, and it turned out three other people were in this program. So I couldn't kind of hide from anybody. And they kept bringing me to meetings. And, and uh, I was told to find a sponsor that was in the book, which I did. And um, I, I went to big book meetings from the very get go. And that's why I think I intellectually knew this program very well. I didn't have it 
totally in my heart. In fact, I was using the program to keep people away from me um, because of fears. And, and that shift came for me right around uh, 20 years or so that I, I realized this was much more than just stopping drinking and knowing the words. I'd like to go there if it's okay with you. You've mentioned a couple of times, I mean, you, you've talked about the shift at 20 years, and then you talked about not being able to give away something you didn't have, which was love in your heart. And I'm curious what, what created that shift for you? How did you access that love that you're talking about having now? Well, there's something in the book that I think sometimes people don't really look at and they think about recovery as, oh, you get get in recovery and everything is live happily ever after or something. And um, uh, there's a couple of things that I've understood now. We have to get rid of several lifelong conceptions, it says in our book. And, you know, um, I didn't, I don't know, I guess I thought maybe... I, I maybe I wouldn't have to do that type thing, you know. I, I I'm doing pretty well. Anyway, it says you've got to get rid of your old ideas and the results and no one until you let go absolutely. And it doesn't say old bad ideas. I think I added bad in there, so maybe I didn't have it. And it talks about the fact that we're driven by a hundred forms of fear, self delusion. Self delusion has been the one I've been playing with probably for the last ten years or so. Because um, even in recovery, I think we can get deluded. We have so many years, or we have this or that, whatever, and this isn't a daily reprieve again. All of a sudden, we're resting on some old things we did in the past, and and we're not really current with where we're at today. So that's kind of what happened to me. I think I fell asleep with logic and reason. And how what happened for me was I was uh, reading Bill's story uh, right around. 20 years, and and I saw those words where he says uh, he turned all things into his newfound friend, and I went, what? And it was like, I went, friend, do I think of my higher power or my God of my understanding as a friend? And, and then as I sat with that and pondered that, I realized, no, I hadn't been raised in any specific re- religion that was like I've had a lot of friends, so I didn't have to uh, unlearn anything. But people would say, well, have a God of your own understanding and then say, you know, all powerful, omnipotent and all this stuff. So people ask me what I believe, I believe in, the, you know, but it was, it was intellectual. And so I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, I have a friend. I've had a friend that I've sponsored for 41 years, but I've known her. She and I have been best friends since we were six years old. So I know what a friend is. And you know, she all of a sudden popped up on the screen. She and I just take a look at each other and go, ah. And the energy that I felt. And it was at that moment the shift started to happen. It was like, oh. And right about that time as I was pondering that, I had a little kitty. And, and the kitty jumped up on my lap. And I realized at that moment I felt that energy from that cat. The cat loved me so much. It was present even when I didn't want it present. It was present. And and I and I realized there was an energy that I felt. And then as time has gone on, I realized that I had never prayed to an energy of that love. I had an intellectual thing I was doing. So it wasn't felt. And that's when I started to understand that it was a God of my experience. The energy I felt when I heard in my first meeting I felt it. God, as he expresses himself in our group conscious, was there, and I felt it. And um, and that's when I started to enlarge on that. So we have certain trials and low spots ahead. It's not talked about. A lot of people are not enlarging on their spiritual conception. It doesn't say concept. It says conception all the way through the book. And the conception is a room for some growth. And so... As the years have gone on, I um, I do that. I I enhance this energy bubble so that um, and and what it does is it makes me feel safe and protected, just like that friendship feeling, just like the cat, just like um, many moments I you know where I have felt that safety. I've worked with a lot of people where I say, where do you feel safe and connected? And sometimes they have a beach god or they have a mountain god or and one woman says when i get in my kayak i said let's use the kayak god let's use that energy to move us through to look inside and what's happening so that's 
where the shift changed for me. And it was over years, and I have the privilege of facilitating 12-step retreats over the last 25 years or so. And um, people now understand that I'm not going to work with them unless they get some energy that they can do business with and that will do business with them. Because other than that, it's an intellectual exercise. I can so relate. I mean, I definitely over-intellectualize things. I'm an engineer by trade and it's, <laughs> it's my job to think of things and yeah. solve problems with my mind. And that doesn't work with uh, this program for sure. I love the concept of God as energy. And um, I've heard it talked about in the rooms, God is love. You know, my own personal conception of God is, is just this power in the universe that, that I align with when I practice the principles that I've learned in this program. Um, I neglected to ask your sobriety date. September 13th, 1973. So Mary, you mentioned the certain low spots, and I think we all experience those. Can you talk a little bit about low spots that you've experienced in your in your journey of recovery? The most significant one I had was right around 28 to 32 years in recovery. And um, there was um, a belief structure, if you will, uh, on what I believed family was. And uh, I was, um, uh, I'm a social worker. I'm a hospice social worker. Uh, so I, um, and I learned to do that when I was in recovery. And um, and I was taking care of a family member, and um, there were several deaths in my family. And I had a sibling that, hindsight, I can see now, uh, there was a lot of grief that was going on. <clears throat> but there was there was an upheaval that really was something I never would have ever expected coming from my family. I guess that would be it. And it was devastating to me. And I and I couldn't understand why this person was doing what they were doing. And I was, uh, uh, I, I, I was uh, just, uh, uh, the rug went out from underneath me. I couldn't even believe it. There was, there was like no room for any movement or talk. And there was legal things going on. And it was like uh, something out of, the last thing you'd expect after X amount of years of recovery, 28, 30, 30 years of recovery and lawyers and legal stuff. And it was, uh, it, it was really driving me wacko. Uh, I, I, I couldn't even almost take in what was happening. Hindsight, I, uh, it's when everything shifted for me. It was like, uh, that's where the lifelong conceptions were thrown out. That's where I had to see there was a part of me which had an awful lot of false pride. How dare anybody do this to me? Like, you no, know, I'm a social worker. I have all this. And as a result of that, best thing that ever could have happened. And and you could never have told me that. At that point, I reached out to a member in 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 our recovery. Thank God that does the work the way we all do the work. But um. He's Native American, and he talked about the different seasons of recovery. And and I was in um, a, a winter um, season where everything was going to be kind of torn away from me that wasn't going to wasn't going to be going with me. And I and he had one line. He told me. I told him. I said, I can't stop crying. I can't stop. It's almost like I just don't even understand that I had based so much on a perception of what family was supposed to be that it was just it just kind of devastated me and I'm just sobbing away and he said something that I am eternally grateful for he said it sounds to me as though your ego is mourning and it cannot go where you need to go and that was like the shift for me that was where I I thought no, he was supposed to be alive. <laughs> I shouldn't even be alive with the way I've been. So this isn't going to work the way I think it's supposed to work. <clears throat> I want you to know that because of this program, I don't have any anything but gratitude for that. I don't wish it on anybody, but um, it's what I needed to shift a whole series of self-delusion that I had that was blocking me from feeling the presence of the presence. Is that helpful? Very helpful. And I really want to thank you for sharing that personal story. And it just never ceases to amaze me that 
out of the depths of despair comes such beautiful change and awareness. And it's something that I think happens to all of us. Like every alcoholics don't have a corner on the pain market, but we certainly seem to have access to this amazing connection to, to the God of our understanding as a result of the broken times. And I think you're, you're, you're telling us that it doesn't matter how much time in sobriety any of us have, you know, we're going to have these situations and, and they're going to open this up and then beautiful things are going to come to pass as a result. So I think that's hopeful. Yeah, and one thing also, Lee, is that, you know, you, you've got a podcast here that's doing daily. You have different new people and long, long terms and so forth that come and go. Um, one of the things with the Zoom that <clears throat> I've been trying to say almost each time was every single person in the world right now, their life's unmanageable. <laughs> They've been pretty powerless for a year. Uh, we're the ones in the 12-step program that have the other steps. And, um, and, and and for me, I've had to sharpen my tools. And when we started the pandemic, I'd never gone through a pandemic sober or drinking. And I, and I, did, I did steps around the principle of being in a pandemic in order to get some guidelines on some values on how I want to live during this time. And most people don't even have that don't have it they think that this is all about when they were drinking or something and it's about how we how i live a day at a time today that's what this thing does joyful discovery well mary i want to thank you so much for spending time with us this has been a wonderful conversation thanks thanks for having me come back <laughs> okay blessings thanks so much for listening if you want to find us online, you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash Daily Reflection Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Daily Reflector. You can read stories of recovery from our community at blog.dailyreflectionpodcast.com. Please don't forget to give us a rating on your podcast app. We greatly appreciate it. This podcast was produced by Lee McGinnis and Michael Lynn. Editing services by Jeff Bame.